I do want to tell you just a little testimony real quick. You know, I can't stand before you without telling of the goodness of God, okay? We have been giving our tithes and offerings since 1990 when we came in the church as a family together. But I came from a family, two or three generations that I know of, that gave tithes and offerings to the Lord. So when it came our time to live for God and to live life, it's been a little easier on us. Can you say amen? Than it was on our family, you know, my parents, our grandparents, and so on behind us. And that's how it's meant to be. When you're giving tonight, you're investing in the kingdom of God, and he's going to be faithful to your children and your family. You're building up a heritage, and he is going to bless your family beyond measure. I promise you that's how it works. I want to give you just a couple quick stories real quick. One time after church, in the middle of our lives, just living for God, and we were not in some dire straits or need of anything, but a gentleman approached my husband, a gentleman in the church, and he said, I'd like to know how much debt you have, Pastor Michael, because I want to pay off all your debts. Now, we didn't have some huge amount of credit card debt or anything else. I'll just go ahead and be transparent and tell you, our total debt three payments, the total payoff was around $30,000. But that quickly, God wiped the slate clean. Is that just uh, something that happened? No, it's because we were giving our tithes and offerings and being faithful all the way through. I'm building your faith tonight of why we do what we do. We don't just do it out of, out of a routine or a habit. We do it with expectation that God's going to take care of us. Well, I don't know if we should be expecting that if we give in unto God. We should just give it and not worry about it. There is no farmer that sows seed that does not expect that seed to come forth and bring harvest. We are supposed to expect a harvest. He's a great, big, awesome, mighty God. He wants us to expect that harvest. So when you give tonight, place your expectation upon what you put in there. Remember, he's looking for our hearts. He's not looking for our money. God does not need our money. He framed the earth, everything that is here, he placed here. So he doesn't need our money. I want to tell you something else. One time a lady came to our door in the middle of just going along, living life, living for God, always sowing and tithing and giving offerings and being faithful in service. Just everything God asks of us, not perfect, but the best of our ability, raising our children up. Remember the Lord said also he'd rebuke the devourer and the fruit of our ground would not be destroyed. Praise the Lord, the fruit of our ground's been blessed. Amen, it's still going, and so has yours. But a lady came to our door one day, and she brought a check for $1,500. You can't make this stuff up. I'm not lying to you. She said, the Lord told me to bring this check to you and to Pastor Michael. A little bit of time rocked on. The same lady came to the door, and she said, the Lord told me to bring this check to you as well. And it was for $5,000. And that's all I've got time to tell you tonight. She brought more later. She did some more things later, but we're going to cut it off right there. I can't tell you all my testimonies in one night, but I hope I've built your faith. When you're just living life, being faithful, just being faithful, but just expecting, not a specific way that somebody's just going to walk, you know, to knock on your door and hand you something, but just expecting that God is going to take care of you. God is going to bless you. And it's okay to go ahead and expect that he's going to just bless your socks off. He's going to just amaze you because that's the kind of God we serve. Stand up and make your giving ready. We're going to pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus, tonight, Father, we give into your kingdom and we do add expectation to it because we know that you're a faithful God. And we know that it's all right to expect the harvest and to expect the things in your word, Lord, that said would come forth because of our giving. Because when we give our money to you, we give our heart to you. We give our time, our service. We give all that is dear to us to you. And we ask you to bless it. I plead the blood of Jesus over these beautiful givers, every soul that's listening or watching. And I ask you to bless each precious one in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, what's your name, Michael? Yeah. Hey, why don't you set that little girl down there so she can listen to me? I have something I think that's going to change her life and yours as well. Amen? Oh, okay. Good. Yay. 
Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. You know what time it is? It's time to flip the script on the devil. Huh? You know what time it is? That's it. It's time to flip the script on the devil. <clears throat> Lord, I call souls into the kingdom from the north, south, east, and west. May they come flooding in to the house of God with all of their needs, and may they be met by the Spirit of God that resides in every individual in the house of God. May we live in such a way that when someone encounters us, their life is changed instantly. Hallelujah. May we have enough of the Holy Spirit living, abiding, and operating in us that the world is changed just because we're there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you want to be a soul winner, be a soul winner. Amen. The first soul you have to win is your own. The first soul that you have to win is your own. Now, my, my lovely little wife, you get to hear from her occasionally, and what a powerhouse she is. <clears throat> what a powerhouse she is. But I've had to tell her before, only one testimony at a time. You're blowing people away. After a while, people wouldn't believe. They wouldn't believe it. <clears throat> Only one testimony at a time because people wouldn't believe. But I'm here to tell you, God's promises... Is, are this. If you do, I will. You see, you do what you can do in the natural, and he adds the super. Yeah. You do what you can do in the natural, and he will add the super. Amen. Amen. All this is free today. Yeah. This is free. I don't have any notes for this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, the song that we opened up with, let me tell you about my Jesus. That is how you're a witness. And that's why I brought my wife up. <clears throat> when it becomes personal to you, you can't help but overflow on others. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We oftentimes become disconcerted with trying to win souls and witness to people because we are ourselves empty. But when we have the Holy Ghost operating inside of us, operating inside of us, then you are a witness and, and don't even try. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I would uh, oftentimes as a young person, early 20s, become enamored with preachers that would come by. It seems like they brought revival in their suitcase. And uh, you always had an urge to walk in their footsteps, to to just join yourself with them. But I have learned that the Holy Ghost took an ordinary person and supernaturaled him when he was standing before you because his life is just like yours and just like mine. We all meet the mundane of every day that ends in Y. And all of us are weaving our way 
through this world. The difference, I believe, is whether the Holy Ghost has a tight line on you. Hallelujah. And the only way the Holy Ghost can have a tight line in your life is if you stay focused, if you stay prayed up, and if you're doing what you can do. If you are doing what you can do. See, that expectation that she talked about, that's not only applicable to money. It is applicable to money. We have many, many examples. But it's also applicable to smiling. It's also applicable to working. <clears throat> Watch this. We're, we're relatively familiar with fasting around here. And, and if you're not, you'll be more familiar with it as time goes by. And you should uh, um, avail yourself to that occasionally. But we're taught, eat to be healthy, right? Eat, eat to be healthy. But the Bible says, when you fast, your health will spring forth speedily. Hello. Hello. Your health will spring forth speedily. Now, I'm not a nutritionalist, although I get plenty of nutrition. Nor am I a scholar of the human anatomy. But I do know this. If the Bible says it, it works. So how can you expect to receive unless you first give. How can you expect a miracle when you don't have faith for a miracle? Scripture says faith without works is dead. So put your faith to work. Put your faith to work. Amen. Figuratively and physically. It's, it's, the laws of God are amazing. <clears throat> and uh, this law, all of them are amazing to me, but, but uh, we understand the law of gravity. Right? I can feel it pulling on me right now. And, and uh, I don't know if we understand this law or not, but it's the law of perpetual motion. Things that are in motion tend to stay in motion. Wow. So let's liken that to our thought process. What is your thought process? Is your thought process, well, as one person said, it just keeps getting worse and worse? Or is your thought process, the Lord said, yea, and amen, therefore I go. Amen. Amen. Now, all of that was just totally free. I got a passage of scripture, and I want to talk about taking our life back. I'm talking about the church taking its life back. Amen. I have been teaching for several weeks down at our other church, the refuge, about taking our lives back. Do you know that we've been sold a bill of goods? Do you know that we've allowed the enemy of our soul to creep into the church and tell us what we should do and what we shouldn't do? That tell us how we should act and how we shouldn't act. I'm here to tell you that the laws of God are yea and amen. They should be practiced, they should be pushed, and they should be adhered to 100%. Hallelujah. Before you ever adhere to a law of man, or let alone an attitude or a personality 
or a thought process of a man, you should first concern yourself with the things that the Lord says. Amen. Amen. Following his pattern for life is not difficult. It just takes some thought. It just takes some prayer. And it just takes some study. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know what I love about the Lord? He's so principled. I love principle. I, I have often been asked in my life, my wife just uh, discovered and informed me that I'm eccentric. This whole time, I was thinking I was the standard for normal. The whole time. No, not really. First Chronicles 28 and 20. I'll finish that thought maybe sometime. I'm going to be reading from the NIV <clears throat> this evening. Simple passage of Scripture. First Chronicles 28 and 20. And David said to Solomon, his son, Be strong and of good courage, and do it. Be strong and of good courage, and do it. Fear not nor be dismayed for the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of God. Amen. Be strong and of good courage and do the work. And watch this, another, another little point in that passage that I want to point out to us this evening is the writer whom we know uh, as David and said, my God. He wasn't talking about generalities. He wasn't saying a God. He said, my God. Amen. He was talking to his son and he said, my God. Listen, that has to become personal. That has to become personal. My God will supply all of your needs according to His riches in glory. Huh? Wow. That's pretty awesome, huh? That is pretty awesome. I want to talk to us on this subject for the next few minutes. You have 15 minutes if you could spare. Over the line. Now, <clears throat> I'll have to admit that, that my personality is, is a strong personality, and I never really knew that as a young person. I never really knew that I had a really strong personality. I didn't. I just thought I was being normal. So when it came to laughing, I laughed really loud. When it came to crying, I cried really loud. When it came to whatever it came to, I wanted to do it to the best of my ability, then add some to it. And uh, that takes a lot of people just off guard. Bad. It really messes with a lot of people who are timid, and I, I didn't know that. I, I mean, I had really had no idea. I thought I was normal, and everyone else was kind of weird. I had a, I had a lady, a precious lady, one time, uh, come into my office, and she said, "I said, well, you know, why hadn't you come prior to now 
to talk about this. And she said, well, I'm scared of you. I said, oh, well, what scares you? So, because I'm not mean, you know, I'm not hateful. I just, I, I don't know. I guess it was my personality. I don't know. But I do know this. I would always look for the line and then step over. I kind of figured this, that if somebody put a boundary or a barrier there, it was for them and not for me. And that general way of thinking caused me some personal issues from time to time. However, I still believe in the principle. Because I know that it works. I know that it works. You see, over the line is where the super gets added to natural. Over the line is where God spends his time. That is to say, he will not do what he expects me to do. He will only help me beyond my ability to help myself. Amen. Amen. So when you decide that you're done being pushed around by the darkness in your life and you're ready to become a victor, you will find that a wolf rises inside of you. Hallelujah. There ought to be something rise up inside of you that just cannot be held back. There needs to be something that leaps in your soul, that leaps in your spirit, that you know, that you know, that you know God is right there. Amen. Let me talk to you about Theodore Roosevelt. Anybody recognize the name? <clears throat> Theodore Roosevelt was the youngest person to hold office. Quite on the contrary, or in diametric opposition to what we have today. Don't want to spend a lot of time there, but I want to talk about Theodore, okay? And you can make all the parallels you want <clears throat> in your mind. But Theodore Roosevelt <clears throat> described the power of joy in battle. <clears throat> that is the joy that floods a person that rises to an occasion, to, to the challenge that's been spread before him. Have you ever been challenged and something inside you was certainly trepidatious? Something inside you kept saying, oh no, you better hold on, you better watch out, you better this, but then there's also something inside of you, in my case sometimes a lot bigger than it should be, saying, go ahead, jump across the line. Go ahead. Let's get this thing done. I would rather get it done than meander around waiting for something to happen. They didn't call me Action Jackson for nothing. Listen, why is it? I believe it is the fire of God in my spirit. I am not afraid to step out and say, Hey, thus saith the Lord. You know why? Because he said, <laughs> I have been, you have been, and I have been sent in the name of the Lord. Do you understand what that means? Do you understand what you being sent in the name of the Lord actually means? When His name was applied to your life, all the power that God operates in was applied to your life. Hallelujah. Therefore, there ought to be somebody ready to step across the line. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> this larger-than-life president, Theodore Roosevelt, 
will always be remembered because his face is etched in stone. Now we, never mind. It would be hard, to, it would be easy to go left right there. Um, but an interesting note about Theodore Roosevelt was he rode with the Rough Riders on horseback. And uh, I noticed that some of us who have a little more gray know a little bit about the Rough Riders. <clears throat> Listen, they used to teach history in this country. The reason that they don't teach history now is they don't want you to know. It's a trick of the enemy. It is a trick of the enemy. Jesus Christ, born of a woman in a manger, rose. He Listen, first, he worked. Do you know that he is known as the son of a carpenter? Have you ever shake, shaken hands with a carpenter? They have the roughest hands. They are calloused, and they are hard people. Their muscles are strong and tough, and they, they are, for the most part, very matter-of-fact people. And uh, Jesus was raised by a carpenter. His ministry did not begin until he was 30 years old. <clears throat> this is a free side note. I have a hard time taking my cues from someone wet behind the ears. Huh? Listen. There's something that experience gives you that you can't buy, you can't read about it in a book, and you will never obtain it short of being there and doing that. So that is to say this, don't tell me about a miracle if you've never experienced one. Don't lay your hands on me if you don't have the power of God working in your own life. Don't think for a second you're going to touch my kids or my grandkids if you don't have the power of God working in your life. Hallelujah. Why would you do that? Why would you allow somebody that could only detract from the Spirit of God that's in you touch you? We should... Adjoin ourselves with people of like precious faith. We should adjoin ourselves with people who say, Give me my mountain. We should adjoin ourselves with people who say, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Hallelujah. You have to be the guy. To be willing to go over the line. Hallelujah. So, the Rough Riders on horseback, can you imagine the youngest president to ever serve this country, Theodore Roosevelt, riding horseback into the Battle of San Juan Hill during the Spanish American War? Hallelujah. Machine gun bullets sprayed out. From the top of the mountain, cutting down man after man after man. Yet Teddy Roosevelt fought on, relentlessly urging his men to move forward. You know how to get run over? Possum, stop in the highway. Stop and look at the lights. You're sure to be a meal for the next possum passing through. You know how to die in your walk with God, Christian? Stop in the middle of the road. And it goes kind of like this. Well, 
I tried that before. Stop. Uh, say match. Smash. Well, I don't know. Boom. Or this. I don't know if it takes all that or not. Might as well shovel you up right now. Why would someone not want what God has? The scripture says he is the giver of every good gift. Every good gift comes from God. So we could equally if we wanted to go that direction, figure out where all those other ones come from. And remember, God is a God of principle. <clears throat> and to stop in your walk with God for only a second certainly means that you're behind at best. At best. The best thing you can hope for is that you can get back in the race. But you'll certainly be behind where you could have and should have been. So, <clears throat> let me move on. In that terrible situation, Roosevelt crossed a barbed wire fence that lay across the battlefield. That was the moment. And that's when he fully committed to the action before him. And at that moment, a wolf rose in his heart. Roosevelt said this, I crossed that barbed wire fence and a wolf rose in my heart. With his trademark spectacles fogged from the humidity and a handkerchief trailing from the back of his sombrero, he steeled himself. He gave no thought to the bullets flying around him and he urged forward his horse, Little Texas. Teddy had flipped a switch inside and he was unstoppable in his resolve to do what he needed to do to accomplish the mission. How many Christians lay on the side of the road? How many Christians stop in the middle of the road wondering who's going to help them? Wondering what's going to happen? I'm just looking for God. I'm just waiting for God. No, you're not. God is in the action. He is not in the waiting. Hallelujah. Remember, put your faith to work. Hallelujah. God is in the action. You know what has happened to the church? Sure you do. But I'm going to remind us. What has happened to the church is they said, they said, Easy now, you know, uh, you know, brother so and so, uh, he did this, and and they said that that guy was fake, and blah 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 blah. Listen, the Bible says, "Touch not my anointed, and do my prophets no harm." So if there is an old brother somewhere doing something that may or may not be right. Quite frankly, it's none of our business because God has a way of working things out. But to get us distracted and sidetracked, the devil will say, did you see that? What about that? They love to talk about this guy in uh, Houston, the largest church in the world. Listen, honey. He's got to be doing something, right? 
He's pointing people toward Jesus Christ. So he and I have something in common. Right? He and I have something in common. Because my pointer, I don't know the answer, but I know the answer. So, Teddy Roosevelt urged his horse forward. A witness said that from the instant Teddy Roosevelt stepped across the wire, he became the most magnificent soldier ever seen. Wow. That's the type of guy that needs to be running this country. Yeah. In God, we trust. Huh? In God, we trust. Listen, let me digress for one moment and talk about his horse, Little Texas. He called him Little Texas. Well, listen here. Here's how God works. He puts things together as you're going. As you're going, he's putting things together. God brought Little Texas into Teddy Roosevelt's life. He probably was a very tough horse. He probably had the same kind of tenacity that Teddy Roosevelt had. Listen, there's only one way that you're going to get through this thing, honey, and that's just keep on going. Uh, some time ago, I don't remember when, doesn't matter, the Lord called me to a full-time pastorate. And it was... 600 miles away from our home. I didn't want to leave my home. I'm honest with you. We, she and I, built that place. We would save our money after working all week and save our money and save our money for months at a time and then we'd go buy an item and put up in that house. It took us five years to build that house and it's still not finished. We would save by Bill. It would take a weekend to install in that house what it took us months to buy. So therefore we had some attachment there. We raised our kids there. Our parents were there. And uh, <clears throat> they called for us to pastor the church. And uh, I was trying to talk it over with my wife about when should we go. When it comes to going, she's not the most prompt, okay? Sweet. She'll get her done when she gets there. The Christmas was coming. Okay? But we got the call way before this, and we had plenty of time to make a decision. We just didn't make it. So I had to make a decision. And I told the guys, just come on down here. We're ready to go. And I didn't tell her. Listen, if you're going to get something done, you're going to have to just get up and get her done. So <clears throat> they took our stuff and went to Oklahoma. We loaded up our vehicles, as it were, and struck out the next day, I believe, next morning, something. But one of the vehicles had trouble on the road. And he would drive 30 minutes and it would die. And I discovered that the alternator was not working. And I don't know if you've ever been on Interstate 40 between Fort Smith, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. But 
but there is absolutely Sunday morning was the next morning. And we were out there Saturday night with a car that wouldn't run. And had my mother-in-law. And my wife, bless her heart, she has a keen eye for the obvious. And her question was this. What are we going to do? So, I had my son pull up there and leave his truck running. Arise and be healed. <clears throat> I took the battery off of his truck, put it on the one where the battery was dead, put the dead battery on his truck, and we could go again. And it was pouring down rain in the middle of the night. I didn't know anything else, but I knew this. We were going to Oklahoma, and I was going to preach in the morning. And I was not going to take no for an answer. God had called me, and he didn't make a provision to get me there. He gave me the good sense to do what I could do, and then he could do the rest. So that spawned the message in my spirit. Going on when quitting looks like the best option. I'm not preaching that today. Perhaps I'll be invited back and we can do that at a different time. But there is something to be said for pressing on. Pressing on. <clears throat> and uh, I did not know what we were going to do. I was certainly concerned. I didn't have the experience then that I had now. However, I was raised on a farm. And I was raised with such experiences happening in my life. I thought they were bad things that were happening, but actually they were not. I was being groomed for such a time as this. You never know what God has in store for you if you're just going to sit on the sideline and suck your thumb, honey. huh? You'll never know what He has for you because you're sitting around waiting for God and the whole time He said, That switch needs to flip inside of you. That wolf needs to rise inside of you. And you need to become a tenacious follower of Jesus Christ. I didn't know where I was other than Interstate 40 in nowhere, Oklahoma. But I knew that God was ahead of me, beckoning me to get there. Beckoning me to get there. And I knew that people had faith in me. I knew that they were waiting for me. I knew that they had an expectation of me. I was not going to sit passively by on the side of the road somewhere waiting for something to happen. In uh, Roosevelt's experiences, history says that a shell exploded beside him and his horse so close that it burnt the hair on his horse and burnt him. A bullet hit him on the elbow, but he kept pressing on. He kept pressing on. <clears throat> He didn't stop until the battle 
was one. For the rest of his life, he referred to that day, July the 1st, 1898, as the greatest day of his life. Listen, how you look at things matter. You know, most of us describing that day would say, I need a check. Get the government to give me a check. I have PTSD. Now, listen, anybody who has served this country in war, I certainly love, honor, respect, and want to take care of them. Amen. 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 But this Christians sitting around looking for a handout from somebody that's not God, you are wasting your time. Roosevelt said it was the greatest day of his life. We would say if this happened, oh, it was the worst day of my life. I was out there on that battlefield. Stuff was blowing up everywhere. And, you know, little Texas man, he got all burnt up on his side. And you would burnt the hair right off of my arm. And then a bullet came. That would be the 2022 version of Teddy Roosevelt's experience. But Teddy Roosevelt said, it was the greatest day of my life. Hallelujah. See, he understood something. He understood his calling at that moment. He was called to be a leader in the army. And there was a cause pressing against his belief system. And that cause pressing against his belief system started a war inside of his belly. And when he saw that fence laying there, he thought, they're trying to keep me out. Bless God, I've been called to this place, and here I am. Yeah. If God called me, God equipped me. If God called me and equipped me, who am I to sit on the sideline pumped up like a possum? Who am I to go against the calling of God? That's what I felt in that pouring down rainstorm at midnight in Oklahoma. I didn't know what we were going to do, but I knew good and well we were going to be there. I knew we were going to be there. What she didn't know is when I got out and opened that hood, I'm going, oh, God, help me. Oh, God, help me. And almost instantly, I had a creative idea. And I said, here's what we're going to do. Now, it was not in my genius to come up with that. But it was an inspired thought, I believe, of the Holy Spirit. I believe that when I got out of that car that day, I stepped across that line. Oh, I stepped across everything that I could do in the natural. I was at least going to get out. You know what I mean? But I needed God to take me for another step. I needed God to take me another step. Fencing you in, friend. What cavernous obstacle stands in your way, friend? Pause. I just put your pause button. You see that? Pause. <clears throat> Teach these guys some etiquette in your class. Yeah, etiquette. My mother was a very proper individual. Very proper. 
And you've probably been around me enough and heard me tell enough tales about her to figure out that I was probably a mama's boy. Loved my dad dearly. I was probably a mama's boy. But she taught us etiquette. In fact, the best way to get a tablespoon across your mouth was put your elbows on the table. Or speak with your mouth full. Just those etiquette things, those simple etiquette things. She was a stickler for those things, and I thank God. It was the Holy Ghost directing her to teach me because I think she and the Holy Ghost both knew. If I didn't have etiquette, I couldn't have anything. As wild as I was, I mean, at least I could be nice. You know what I mean? At least I could not put my elbows on the table. No, let me tell you why it's important. Let me tell you why it's important. And I still got the pause button on, okay? Here's why it's important. <clears throat> because if I lack etiquette, I miss. I miss points. I miss things. I don't even see the fence lying in front of me. If I lack etiquette, I, I have no way of knowing. I mean, I, I can't, I, you know, I can't even pay attention. <clears throat> if I lack etiquette. Now, unpause. There is an incredible power sitting inside every one of us. There is an incredible force inside of every one of us. And that force propels us in a singular direction. Often we take the propulsion of the Holy Ghost and we can get sidetracked pretty easy and head off in another direction and the propulsion from the Holy Spirit might carry us away but pretty soon we lose our way and begin to falter. Teddy Roosevelt pointed little Texas toward the top of the hill and he didn't stop, he didn't turn left, he didn't say I think they're firing less over there and there may be some less mortars over there. He said right there is where God called me to and that is where I'm going. Amen. He was fighting for a cause. Do you know the fight, the Christian fight that we are called to fight is not against our neighbors, although some of them deserve it. In fact, beg you for it. It's not against our spouse, although sometimes we don't see eye to eye. It's not against our kids, although we should grab them by the ear. But the fight is to stay focused and keep marching forward. Marching forward. We used to sing a song that said, I'm marching and moving onward and upward. The kingdom of God is on a forceful advance. We are taking dominion over the darkness. Tearing down the walls of the enemy's camp. You see, that's what the enemy does, is he likes to camp. Let's go camping. And just hang out and make a mess. Throw his beer cans all over your place. Hang out there in a ratty old tent and trash up your place. But here's one thing I know, that the devil can't keep up with me, honey, because I am on the move for God. So whatever kind of trash you toss in the way, it might be a stumbling block for a moment, but my focus is there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So moving on in God is not a suggestion. It's imperative. It's imperative. Now, I'm going to digress because I just left this hanging a moment ago. And I'm going to follow up with this. 
God's ways are as far from our ways as the east is from the west. And we want to categorize everything and keep it into perspective and do it how they say we ought to do it. Do you realize that the church now listens to the world for our directives? Yes. He's even got Christians talking about the guy with the biggest church in America. Listen to this. If you think God's going to do it your way, listen to this. He took a blind guy. Stood in the dirt, made mud, and wiped it in his eye. That seems awful unconventional. Probably counterproductive. In my mind. So listen. If that guy down there is pointing people toward Calvary and having such success, Perhaps I should look. And I mean, I'm, we, well, I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about in general. We have allowed the spirit of the world to convince us how we ought to act in church. I saw a guy one time traditional churches and churches several years ago, all of them used to have a table that sat in front. Most of them said, uh, in God we trust, or uh, had some do this in remembrance, you know. Uh, and on that table, oftentimes, they'd have one of those 10-pound Bibles. You ever seen one of those? Yeah, well, they were have, we were having a Holy Ghost hoedown one night. I mean, people jumping and shouting, bobby pins were everywhere. I mean, the place was coming apart. And somebody got that 10-pound Bible, and there was a guy laying on the floor, and he went, boom, hit him right on the chest with that 10-pound Bible. That guy jumped up off the floor said he never felt better in his whole life. I'm going to tell you something. If I saw somebody coming with that thing, baby, I mean. Because it looks awful unconventional, you know what I mean? Brings all new meaning to laying the word on them, doesn't it? I'd say he was over the line, weren't you? Hey, I've seen people come, used to, we had youth rallies. And people from everywhere would come to the youth rallies. I saw a dude one day, this is not a joke. He had taken an American flag and made himself a suit. He had a shirt and pants, and those pants were tucked in high-top cowboy boots. Maybe your brother from another mother, huh? But this dude was slap-dab crazy. In my estimation now. Man, the Holy Ghost got to moving. And that flag got to running around that church. I'm telling you what, buddy. I didn't know whether to sing the Star Spangled Banner or to start running with him. You know what I mean? Oh, say, can you see? That dude made about three laps around there. And I don't know if he got tired. I don't know if he got embarrassed. But he, all of a sudden, he took off running and jumped into baptistry. Flag and all. And 
And then here comes some other cornball down the middle row doing somersaults. I don't know what they were doing, but I know what the Holy Ghost was doing. He was working on my soul. He was changing my life. Listen, now when the Holy Ghost begins to move, we all sit around all pious. You know what? Bring me some flag boys in here, huh? Bring me some somersets in here. Hallelujah. We got enough wet blankets. We need somebody that got to move in the Holy Ghost. You know how to move in the Holy Ghost? Move. You know how you don't move in the Holy Ghost? <laughs> Remember the laws that we talked about? The law of perpetual motion? There are other laws too. It's a law of lethargy. Sleep begets sleep. You ever notice somebody that's really sleepy? They sleep all the time. Doc, I'm going to tell you what. When about 5 o'clock hits in the morning, I'm awake. And if I don't get up, my legs start cramping. I got to get up and start moving. I got to get up and start moving. Movement begets movement. You want a Holy Ghost church? Be a Holy Ghost man. You want a Holy Ghost church? Be a demonstrative worshiper. You want a Holy Ghost church? Be a Holy Ghost responder. Maybe sometime I'll preach that message. A Holy Ghost first responder. I'm bringing healing in my sack, baby. Well, what would they think? Well, I don't know. But I do know this. There have been more miraculous things happened to me in a Holy Ghost hoedown than there ever has been than there ever has been in a traditional sit there and listen to me. Listen, I believe in show and tell. Do you know they don't do show and tell anymore? They just do squall and yell. Oh, what's wrong? I don't know. Give them some medicine. Give them a job. Have them pick something up. You know what we had to do? Listen to this. Here was school in 1969. We didn't have that. We had cigar boxes with pencils and crayons in them, blue. And we took that in there, in the school. We marched to our own little cubby in the closet. We hung up our own coat. We went to our own desk that had our name on it. We put our paste out in the little hole for the paste. We put the pencils in the little slot for the pencils, and we put the box right in there. Yeah. And we sat there waiting for the next instruction. You want to see school 2022? Have a bunch of animals herd on up in here, and you bring 50 of them down to the office at a time. We'll pop a couple pills in their mouth, and then you get all their stuff ready for them, and we'll see if we can find somebody to read to them. Listen, Doc, I ain't going to get it. So, therefore, we take that approach in church. Well, come on, preacher. See what you got. 
while we are like the rock of Gibraltar. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. When the Holy Ghost is begging for you to do a little dance. He saved my soul from a burning hell. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. You think I'm just going to sit around, huh, like a little man who pams a little Christian when he saved me? You think I'm just going to sit down like a bump on a log, honey, when the Lord delivered me from every manner of filthiness? Oh, no, you sit there if you want to. But me and Jesus got our own thing going, mama, huh? There are areas in my Christian walk wherein I am weak. And there are areas in life that I am probably tender in. But this one thing I know, you and I were created to praise God. We were created to praise God. Created to praise God. And you know what happens when people begin to praise God? It catches on like a wildfire. Do you know that I have seen blind people eyes open? Do you know that I have seen people with broken limbs healed and one of these <laughs> You think that's funny? You ought to see me when I was younger, huh? I refuse to sit passively by on my side of the line and wait. No. No, I'm going to get right on out there amongst them. Step right over the line and say, Here I am, Jesus. 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 Yeah. Yeah. You know the best defense against the enemy in your life is a very good offense. Well, we have spent that 15 minutes. I'm not done, but I will quit. My prayer is this. Father, humble me to see the areas that I'm weak in and that need attention. The thoughts that need rerouting and the words that need softening. I want to be changed by the power of the Holy Ghost. I want to be known as a Jesus man. One of the greatest compliments I've ever heard given to my dear brother Ray was this. He's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So you know what time it is, church? Time to start taking your life back. Amen. It's time to take your life back. Amen. You know where it is? It's on the other side of the line. Your life is on the other side of the line waiting for you. 
waiting for you. Well, what, what areas should I go on the line in then? I'm here. You think I just march over there and tell my neighbors off? Well, wrong line. <laughs> the first line every Christian ought to cross is the line of I'm not embarrassed to worship Jesus. 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 Mm -mm. No. No, you can pick my life apart. I'm easy. But I'm not embarrassed to worship Jesus. Oftentimes, I have to get past my own stinking thinking. But the reality of the matter is, Every miracle is wrought in the extraordinary. Cross the line. I'm going to give you one more testimony, and we're going to quit. I told you about my wife and I building our house. And we lived in the country. I mean, country. I'm not talking about maybe just a sachet and a couple of trees. I'm talking about in the sticks. We didn't have any water. The only way we'd get water is hire somebody to drill us a well. And I told you that we saved money and saved money and saved money. I was making less than $5 an hour as a tool and die maker. And she was a receptionist at a very well-known factory there and she made less so we didn't have a lot of money but to drill a well cost a lot of money so we saved our money and we saved our money and we saved our money and we prayed and we believed and we found some dude some dude in a station wagon he come to drill our well, and he drove up in a station wagon. Listen, have you ever seen a have you ever seen a well drilling truck? I mean, it's a big old truck, this big old monstrosity thing on the back, you know, carrying lots of extra pipes and all this kind of stuff. This dude drove up in a station wagon. A little girl. And I'm, I'm, I'm about like this sister here thinking, oh my God. What in the name of God is this? Hey, he opens up the back of that. I'm waiting for a truck to pull up. I thought maybe he was just the boss. Or he, he opens up the back of that station wagon and pulls out a little lawnmower engine. I'm not kidding, no. A little lawnmower and just a little bitty old pipes. You know, I'm thinking, oh, Jesus. <laughs> I had bought all my well casing. I would bought the well pump. I bought the wire. I, I, I had everything there, man. I had the bladder tank. I had everything for a well. All I needed was a hole in the ground with water in it. Okay, so this dude, I'm not kidding you, pulls a little bitty, you know, three-horse lawnmower engine out of the back of his station wagon. And he sets it up over there, and he... <laughs> he starts to sing out, <laughs> and he starts drilling. <laughs> and he drill about four feet, and he lift that thing up, put another thing up. <laughs> Seemed like it took him all day. went about 90 feet. The sand started coming out there. It's like sand on a beach, and he goes, there's water. Ah, oh, cool, great. That's that's he said. That's good. That's good. Well, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So I put my casing in there, man. Now this is all the money that we had. This is every bit of money that we had to our name. I started sinking it down in that hole, ninety feet in that hole. I put the other pipe together, put the well pump on it, put the wire on. It, I started sinking it down in that hole. 
It was almost dark. Late in the evening. I got everything hooked up. But you can't imagine. I lived with my mother-in-law for five years. I was ready to move. And if she could have got away with it, she'd have killed me and told God I died. <clears throat> so we sink all that down in this well. My dad was there. My wife was there. My sons were there. This man in his station wagon, his daughter. All day. Got it all in there, got it hooked up. I ran in there and turned it on. Yeah. The muddiest, nastiest water you've ever seen in your life came out of there for about three seconds. And it was over. It got just this quiet, and I got just these looks from everybody that was there because they were all looking at me. Her look of dismay on her face. I'm sure I looked like I'd been slapped in the face with a wet pickle. My sons were there. My father was there. Speechless. We tried getting the casing out, couldn't get it out. All of my money was stuck in a dry hole in the ground. I told my wife, I said, take the boys, go. Help that guy load up his stuff. My dad went home. I walked around behind the house. I don't know why I walked behind the house, but I walked behind the house because I was afraid somebody was going to see me, you know, 100 miles out in the country. Nobody. <laughs> but I walked around behind that house, and I fell down to my knees, and I screamed out, Jesus! When I finally got my composure, I staggered back to my car and went home. We talked about it all week, you know, what we're going to do. The, the thing that was keeping us from moving into our house we didn't have any water. We didn't have any water. We didn't have any money. And uh, something said to me one afternoon after work. I went out there just kind of walking around, kind of walking, just kind of bum-fuzzled, just walking around. And something said to me, try the well. I went in and turned that thing on, brother. And I want you to know I raised my kids there. We filled up swimming pools. They played in the sprinkler. We did everything that a person would need to do and never ran out of water. It was the sweetest, best water you ever drank in your life. Came out of a dry hole in the ground. One thing I never did was lose my step. <laughs> Why don't we stand together? Let me tell us something, church. I'm going I'm to preach my whole message in about one sentence right here. Go ahead and bust a move. Go ahead and cross the line. And expect Jesus Christ to meet you there. <laughs> expect him to meet you there. Listen, the God that I'm talking about heals blinded eyes. The God that I'm talking about, oh, the God that I'm talking about, ah, the God that I'm talking about heals broken bones. The God that I'm talking about makes sweet water come out of a dry hole in the ground. You know what I did? All I could do. All I could do. Hallelujah. So don't tell me, honey, that you can't expect anything from Jesus Christ. You know what I expect from Jesus Christ? A miracle. Ha. 
In fact, my Bible says that miracles, signs, and wonders will follow them that believe. Huh? Huh? You know what you can't follow? Somebody that's sitting still. You know what the Holy Ghost is looking for? A vehicle. Motion. You better turn this thing off, Mr. Sound Man. I can't quit. We bless your name, Jesus. We bless your name, Jesus. I think we need to get a little jump in our step. <laughs> I think we need to get a little volume on our praise. I think we need to get a little bit of attitude in our Holy Ghost. Huh? Hallelujah. Sunday at 1030, you're dismissed. Peace.